Hey everyone, uh, we're looking to hire a part-time communications manager to join the Epicenter team. You can get more information about that position at epicenter.tv slash apply. So if you're interested in learning more about that, if you have, think you have what it takes, go to that website uh, and uh, you'll find the job description and uh, the instructions on how to apply for our communications manager position. Thanks. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by the Ledger Nano S, the hardware wallet which sets the new standard in security and usability. Get it today at ledgerwallet.com and use the offer code EPICENTER to get 10% off your order. And by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with Greg Meredith. Greg Meredith is a researcher around a lot of interesting areas, such as concurrency theory, type theory, essentially parts of mathematics. He's also one of the co-founders of a project called Scenario, which I think probably a lot of you have at least heard about in, in some way. And he's been doing a lot of interesting work in this field. Among other things, he's been working with uh, Vlad Zamfir, who's been on this podcast before as well, uh, on Casper. Um, so, yeah, thanks so much for coming on, Greg. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure. Thank you. And thanks for your patience for finding the time for us to get together. <laughs> no, it's, it's a pleasure. Well, can you, can you give us a little bit of background? So one of the things we read about you was that you were involved in something like at Microsoft called the BizTalk Process Orchestration. So I was really curious, is this, what was this work and did this in any way kind of flow into the work you do today related to blockchain and decentralized systems? You know, it really is. Actually, you can think of the BizTalk Process Orchestration as the first generation of internet scale smart contracting. Um, and just like um, the scenarios Rolang is built upon um, a core mathematical foundation uh, arising from concurrency, so was BizTalk process orchestration. Um, so we had a little smart contracting language that was called Xlang um, that uh, um, was built around something called the asynchronous pi calculus. Um, and we had a nice, uh, nice little um, uh, environment where you could draw smart contracts in a graphical interface and then it would synthesize um, an execution um, that would uh, that would would run uh, at enterprise scale and we had uh, uh, a large uh, large kinds of clients like the UK uh, tax return system uh, amongst amongst others uh, that were built uh, using BizTalk. Um, the and it gave rise to a whole bunch of uh, standards. So uh, Bepl and BPML, those all derive directly from, from Xlang and from the work that we did at Microsoft. Likewise, WS Choreography, that all derives directly from the work that we did on BizTalk Process Orchestration. So first generation smart contract is the way you think about it. And, and so can you give an example of, of what kind of process or functionality would be executed or managed with these tools? Sure, of course. So um, one of the domains that we did was supply chain management. Right? So you, you could imagine that Ford Motor Company um, wants to be able to manage relationships with vendors like Firestone, where they, they, um, they're able to get the right kind of supply of tires and other kinds of things uh, for the vehicles that they're shipping. Um, and so they want to be able to um, write down processes about when to, when to um, uh, issue orders um, and how those orders uh, for tires are related to shipping vehicles out to distributors. So you would you would describe a process for each of the different participants and then you could glue the different processes together and also verify um, uh, that the execution of these different processes um, would be correct. Uh, one of the one of the interesting things was that, it was very difficult to get Microsoft to understand that this could be done in a decentralized way. 
Uh, so the, the best I could hope for uh, in the Microsoft setting was a kind of hub and spoke enterprise based um, uh, execution model. That was what they could understand and that's what they felt they could productize. Um, but from the, from the very beginning I was explaining uh, that this was in fact um, uh, uh, the, uh, a decentralized kind of offering. And in fact, when I, when I walked into Microsoft, um, it was just me. Um, and there were, uh, at the time, this kind of notion was called workflow. And there were, there were six other workflow projects inside Microsoft, uh, Office, SQL, um, and many other uh, large groups already had workflow engines uh, under construction when I was making my proposals. And typically, they built them around uh, sort of state machine semantics. And I would say, well, that's that's really interesting. So let's let's take a look at that in the in a in a workflow that involves both Microsoft and HP. Um, who owns the state machine? Where does that state machine run? Because if you're going to run it over an HP, you've just given HP a critical part of your your business. And if uh, you run it over at Microsoft, you've just asked HP to give HP's critical business over to Microsoft. So that isn't going to fly. So how do you do that? How do you apportion that work? And it was the mathematical formalism that I had that enabled me to talk about how you apportion and delineate those communications and collaborations as smart contracts that enabled me as a single lone individual <laughs> with a ragtag team of, of rebels inside Microsoft um, to, to build BizTalk process orchestration despite the fact that SQL and Office and a bunch of other large-scale groups were trying to do the same thing. They would have killed us, uh, but we had, we had sort of secret special sauce that made it work. That's really fascinating. I didn't know about, uh, about BizTalk uh, process orchestration. And what's fascinating is that uh, so I, I, I'm co-founder of a company called Stratum, and we're building something that there's very similar to what you described, uh, but that has that distributed component to it. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll probably look into uh, BizTalk process orchestration <laughs> after the show. Yeah. Also check out the standards, WS Choreography and Bepel and all of those. There are lots and lots of these standards out there right now and lots and lots of workflow engines. So how did you transition from that into the cryptocurrency blockchain space? You know, it's a, it's a, it was a crazy ride. Um, the, um, what I um, ex explained to Microsoft was, uh, you, you have to understand that when I, when I did this work, I did a very sort of, um, I guess in some sense, cynical analysis. Um, um, Gardner, Forrester, and many of the other gr groups were estimating um, the market for, for this kind of workflow at trillions of dollars. And I figured the inefficiency inside um, Microsoft would be such that I would I would only get one thousandth of that. And I thought, well, okay, that's still a billion dollar market, it's still worth going after. Um, so when we delivered kind of the hub and spoke solution, which with with which I was very dissatisfied, I said, look, you've left most of the money on the table. Um, let's let's go after this for real. Let's build a new operating system and a new programming language based around these tools and techniques. And they said, you're crazy, but you might be the right kind of crazy. So here's an office directly under the CTO, Craig Mundy. Have at it. So we built a programming language called Highwire, which is not too, not too dissimilar from Rolang. And in 2003, I demonstrated to Bill some of the cool techniques that you could do with Highwire. Like we introduced, a, a, um, we introduced on purpose a deadlock inside some distributed processes, and the compiler caught the deadlock as a part of the demo. Um, and if you look at uh, how that relates to Rolang, it's, it's closely related to how the Rolang type system would catch the DAO bug. In, in the case of the DAO bug, there's a race condition um, that the type system detects. And uh, in, in this case, it was a, a deadlock that we were, we were illustrating. But both are examples of liveness conditions. Um, and so, so that's, that's kind of some of the kinds of things that you can do with the maths. Um, but when we were looking for a market, the market that I was looking at, uh, and I was quite interested in, was biology. The reason I was interested in biology was because, you know, um, well, for mul multiple reasons. W one of which was that people were beginning to employ our, the mathematical tools and techniques quite successfully to biology. 
Um, and uh, an, another was because that was an area where Microsoft was not. Um, and so it seemed like a match made in heaven. And also, it turns out, if you, if you, look, if you look at this, from a, again, from a purely market perspective, in the U.S. alone, um, health care is 17% of GDP. So if you have good, good, sound solutions for um, reasoning about um, therapeutic, um, like cell signaling chains and uh, immunological uh, phenomena and uh, disease phenomena like uh, multiple sclerosis, um, then you essentially have a license to print money. So I suggested, hey, let's go and do that. Microsoft didn't want to do that, but I had already developed relationships with Merck, the Institute for Systems Biology, uh, the Trento uh, Labs, etc. And I said, and I said, hey, I've got all the relationships. I'm going to go off and do this on my own. So I started a, um, I started a little biotech company, um, and. Uh, and began sitting with the sitting with the biologists, and one of the things I realized was they were swimming in data, they were drowning in data, and so what we needed was a content delivery network just for the data alone that fit with their market requirements. Um, I'm about to bring this story home, and I'll shut up and <laughs> open up space for the next question. But um, so while I was doing that, I was approached by another entrepreneur who said, "Hey, you know what? I'm really, really worried about the privacy imbalance." that's being created by applications like Facebook and other social media. And I'm also worried about the economic imbalance. I think these two trends could be disastrous for a democratic society. And so I, I listened carefully to this message and we began working together. And I realized I could pivot my content delivery network into a content delivery network, not for, for data in biology, but for social networks. Um, and then I started looking at, hey, how do I monetize that? And that's when I looked at the blockchain. And that's how I met Door. Because we started, that's, you know, we, Door and I kind of had the same intuitions about the need for an attention economy. Okay, great. That, that's actually one of the, one of these phrases I wanted to, to sort of hatch on and explore a little bit. What do you mean with attention economy? What, what is that? Yeah, so that's that's a really great question. Um, I mean, if if you think about it, your your social feed is kind of like a little model of your present moment, right? It's it's what what you can see of the world and what you can uh, make of that little particular uh, social world that that is, you know, say Facebook or Twitter. Um, and whoever controls what falls into your so uh, present moment. Right, what what's within the, you know, the bounds of your attention? They're essentially framing your worldview. And so, if there are economic factors in play for how that for how your worldview is framed, well, that essentially becomes a kind of attention economy, right? The, what what is available to your attention, um, if that's if that's informed by economics, well, that's a kind of attention economy. But this is this is a really um, critical idea when we start to think about um, the sharing of social information. And, and I really want to set the stage here because um, I feel like the sharing of social information is becoming more and more important. The planet is melting. If you are not alarmed by the climate data, let me repeat this, if you are not alarmed by the climate data, you are not paying attention. Um, and so we need to be able to communicate with each other to solve the problems that are desperately facing the human race. Um, and 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 the the current the current um, incumbents are not uh, well suited for having those kinds of um, discussions where we can begin to organize ourselves. Um, and if you look at let's take a look at I, I always pick on Facebook. Look, I, I have to say I love Facebook. A lot of my friends are on Facebook. I stay in touch with the Guitar Circle community, the Guitar Craft community started by Robert Fripp via Facebook. Um, and uh, and so I, I don't I don't mean to pick on Facebook, but it really is a part of an older older wave of technologies. So the, the way to think about this, like right now, if if you're a centralized company like Facebook. At any point, the NSA can come knocking on your corporate doors and they can say, here's a court order from a secret court. You know, give me all of Brian Crane's data. And if Facebook wants to keep doing business in the U.S., Facebook has to comply. 
Um, and so, you know, maybe that's the cost of doing business. Um, but the reality is that Facebook has also shown itself to be susceptible to manipulating people's feeds, right? So they've run psychology p experiments on people, right? And published papers about the, about the results of, of manipulating people's feeds. So if you want to see a, the real impact of manipulating the information that people are associated with, go, go look at that. That's, that's real. That's a, that's a, that's a thing. Um, so just two more points and then I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. Um, so if, you know, some people might say, hey, that's the, you know, I'm, I'm willing to make that trade off um, because I don't want to deal with the headaches of running data centers and all the other stuff that's required to do, do social media at scale. Um, now, now, that might work, except that there's another, there's another gotcha that ties back into this whole idea of the economics that's associated with the manipulation and um, essentially hijacking of your attention. If you think about the analog of Facebook 50 years ago, what is that? That's the New York Times, right? But, but let's think about the New York Times. The New York Times writers and curators, they got paid. They got paid pretty well. Now, who's the analog of the, of the New York Times writers and curators today? That's us. That's you and me. We're, we're the content providers. We write the articles for Facebook, and we curate the articles for Facebook. But are we participating in the economics of Facebook? So Facebook is making billions of dollars in profit per quarter. Are we, as a culture, participating in that economic uh, 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 proposition? No, we're not. Right. In fact, what's happening is quite the opposite. There's a growing divide between the haves and the have-nots, which makes it harder and harder for the bulk of the people who are have-nots to organize their own attention to solve these literally burning issues. So that's kind of what we're talking about when we talk that those are the stakes with respect to the attention economy. And the, 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 the mechanism of the attention economy for us is simply to um, wed uh, a cryptocurrency to the promotion of content so that value follows valued content. Right. As when, you know, if Abed makes a post and Troy um, wants to promote that because he thinks that 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 post, which may be about climate data, for example, is important. Right. So he might put some scenario amps behind that post so that more people see it. Right. Um, and then if people then uh, engage that post, then amps will flow back towards Abed, who is the originator of that post. And maybe some of them will go back to Troy, who is who was a, a curator of that post, right? So people begin to participate in the economic engine. They're part of the solution um, in, in that way. Does that make sense? Am I? Yeah, so I, I really enjoyed that whole discussion of, um, you know, of, of how social networks work. And this is something I've been thinking about for quite a long time as well. Uh, so I, um, I've been, for example, following this guy uh, named Cal Newport for, I don't know, like five years or something. I've been reading his stuff. And uh, he's a sort of a computer scientist, and he's a big uh, sort of enemy of uh, social media. And he wrote a book called The Deep Work, uh, which is essentially the argument just that this, you know, kind of destroys our focus. And, and uh, I, I also deleted my Facebook account like three weeks ago or something after <laughs> And it was interesting, too, because there was no other... So I joined Facebook when I, I was in college when it, in the U.S. when it launched, right? So it was sort of, I guess, among the first to join it. So it was the longest service I've used of any application. Like It was like, you know, 12 years or something. Wow. So, yeah. And the main reason, actually, when you think about it, it's, it's exactly what you kind of described in your paper, right? It's... What is what are they trying to do? Right? They are trying to get you to spend as much time on Facebook as possible, clicking on random stuff, viewing their ads, etc. Which is obviously not uh, in alignment with my objectives for my own life, right? So it's like you're fighting against that, and it's. I feel also where. So I think it's it's a very good point that this is going to be like one of the key, um, you know, one of the key skills in 
in the future, you know, is to be able to manage your own attention because there's it's just gonna the tools to distract yourself. It's just gonna get worse, better and better, and. <laughs> And I, I think this is a big danger that a lot of people, if they're not able to do that, they'll just literally not a be able to do anything of value. I, I would add something to that, Brian. And I, I would say that, it, that because uh, I watched that that uh, talk that you had mentioned by by this guy, Cal Newport, which I guess we'll, we'll link to in the show notes. And he says that, uh, I, I think, uh, Greg, you may have mentioned this earlier, that um, these algorithms are made for that are made to make you addicted to to using Facebook. And I, I got to say, like, in the last year, I've seen the quality of content in my feed reduce drastically. And I find myself looking at it, having no interest in any of it. So, I mean, I guess it would be valuable if, if I would be interested in the content. But for some reason, my profile must be in some weird spot in the algorithm where, like, there's a mismatch between what I actually want to see and what I'm seeing, which is, for some reason, just Donald Trump videos. <laughs> I don't even live in the U.S. I am not an American citizen. I, I couldn't care less about Donald Trump. Um, and that's all I see. So... I, I so on, on your queue, Brian. I, I didn't delete my account, but I deleted the app from my phone, and uh, and it's been two days, and like I find myself going to my phone to look at it, but it's not there. So I'm like, okay, I gotta do something else. But I, I just just to point out that the, not only is it sucking our attention, but it's in my case sucking my attention with something that is is just not of any value to me. Let's take a break to talk about the Ledger Nano S, the new flagship hardware wallet by Ledger. I'll let Ledger CEO, Eric Larchevec, tell you all about how simple the Nano S makes it to securely store all your private keys. The Ledger Nano S is our latest generation hardware wallet. This is a multi-currency hardware wallet. It has a screen and buttons to manage everything on screen. You can generate a new seed, restore a seed, or set up your pin on the device your seed will never be exposed to the host computer. On the Nano S, you have different apps. You have the Bitcoin app, you have the Ethereum app, and you have the Fido U2F app for strong authentication, for instance, with Google, Dropbox, or GitHub. You can manage your cryptocurrencies with the Ledger Wallet Bitcoin Chrome app or the Ledger Wallet Ethereum Chrome app with the Nano S, all your Bitcoin and Ethereum addresses are derived from one unique seed. With one seed, you can have in the same time Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ethereum Classic balances. And also, if you restore your seed, you will also recover all the keys associated to other apps such as Fido U2F, SSH, GPG. So it's very simple, just one seed and multiple applications. The Nano S sets the new standard in hardware wallet security and usability. You can get yours today at ledgerwallet.com. And when you do, be sure to use the offer code EPICENTER to get 10% off your first order. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of EPICENTER. So let's, let's then move on to, let's, let's move to scenario, because uh, this is why we're here. Um, let, let's then describe scenario from a high level. Uh, what is scenario and what's it trying to achieve? Uh, yeah, so the, those are those are big questions, actually. <laughs> um, so I think initially, scenario um, uh, we we sort of presented the scenario the scenario to the world as as you know a decentralized social network. Um, but in order, but there's there's a lot more to it, and and this has to has to do with kind of peeling the onion, right? In order to build a decentralized social network, there end up being certain technical requirements, right? So um, you have to be able to handle content at scale. And right now the current blockchain doesn't handle content at scale. Um, it, it doesn't even handle transactions at scale. Um, so, you know, the kind of application that we're envisioning scenario grows up to be, and it's not there yet, but it, what, we, what we envision it growing up to be is essentially handling, you know, visa level transactions at scale and Facebook level content uh, distribution at scale. So, you know, blockchain just doesn't do that. Um, and the, our, our, our 1.0 architecture proposals, um, they essentially put the blockchain side by side with the content delivery network. And then the reason was because I, de I built a, a content delivery network that I am fairly confident can scale up to that. 
Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of work, but but I know the engineering path to get there. Um, and whereas with the blockchain, I didn't know the engineering path, and I was quite naive about you know a side by side architecture. Having worked in the blockchain space now for over two years and looking at proof of work and and other kinds of consensus algorithms and and what it would take to build uh, a, a consensus algorithm that is scalable. Um, I, I, I came to the conclusion rather late in the game. Like if you compare to Ethereum or even Steam, they made progress because they said, we're going to own the chain itself. We're just going to take ownership of the chain and build our technology around, you know, a code base that, that is ours that we can muck with. Uh, Scenario tried to use blockchain technology at, via off-the-shelf technology. Uh, hoping against hope that we didn't have to take that on since building the content distribution network and productizing that is quite hard. Eventually we came to the conclusion that's not possible and we have to own the chain itself in order to have a scalable chain and a scalable chain technology that would allow us not only to, um, to be in charge of how the transaction fees uh, are related to um, the attention economy, but also to be able to eventually put um, content itself on the chain for a wide variety of reasons, like including making sure that, that the storage is a part of the proposition, um, uh, a part of the economic proposition of the decentralized network. So with that in mind, then Scenario um, uh, sort of ended up having to be a much more of a platform company than we had originally thought. So Scenario is also, um, you know, below the social network, it's also a platform. It's a platform for a wide range of applications that include um, both uh, content distribution. Uh, as an example, uh, one of our key partners is LivelyGig. And they do, um, they do uh, essentially freelance networking for the decentralized space. Um, and they're, they're, they've built their whole architecture around our content delivery mechanism and also uh, and are, are, are taking a, a heavy bet on our chain, which is um, literally our chain, <laughs> the scenario chain. Um, so hopefully that gives you a, a little bit of a picture. Uh, if you look, if you explode the view of our chain a little bit, what you'll see is that there's a, a smart contracting language in addition to a scalable blockchain. And that smart contracting language is quite distinct from other contracting languages. Uh, it's not like Solidity because it's, it's built on a different model of computation. Um, and, uh, and, and that is in, what's important there is that um, all of the scenario architecture is built on mathematical foundations that allow us to, to make ev everything um, in alignment with a correct by construction paradigm. Just one quick example, and then I'll, I'll shut up. Um, so if you look at the way uh, the Ethereum virtual machine was developed and Solidity were, was developed, they were developed more or less independently. And so then there's a requirement when you build a compiler from Solidity to the Ethereum virtual machine that that compiler does the right thing. Because if it doesn't, that's a vector of attack. Right? Someone could come in and and um, generate uh, uh, bytecodes for a smart contract that you wrote that does other things, uh, um, uh, evil things, um, uh, and that and and so there's a there's a requirement to prove that the compiler is correct. There's an alternative, which is that you derive the shape of the language from the shape of the virtual machine. In which case, there's no correctness. There's no proof of correctness. Uh, 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 for the compiler. The, the compiler is correct by construction because the shape of the language conforms to the shape of the execution model of the virtual machine. So that's just one example of many where Scenario is, is using mathematics to shave its costs. I don't have to go and hire a team of, of, of formal verification experts to prove the correctness of my compiler because we get it for free. Okay, but perhaps perhaps we can uh, come back to this topic of formal verification. You know, you mentioned Ethereum uh, and the DAO, I believe, earlier. So maybe we can come yeah. back to this a little bit later because I think it's an important topic. But staying on Scenario, so if if I understand correctly, then uh, Scenario is um, is the the platform which 
allows uh, for this social media uh, platform to exist, but you just built the entire stack. So scenario, the, the, the social media app is one of those, one, one app that could live on the platform, which also includes a blockchain, a smart contract language and a storage system. And also, you know, tomorrow someone could develop some other type of application on that. Uh, is is that example, a good way of looking at it? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And we got, like even in 2010, we were looking at how we would segment the market. And the way we segment the market relative to the potential applications has to do with risk, personal risk of the users. So there's not a lot of risk in posting cat memes, right? It's not, you have nothing at stake um, when you post cat memes. Uh, or, or any, any, uh, any of a multitude of other kinds of things that are typically shared on social networks. If you move um, just a little bit to the right of that, then, you, then a jobs network like LivelyGig, you do have a lot more risk, right? So it's a decentralized platform whereby people are trying to connect with each other to either um, do work or get work done. Um, and, and there you have, um, you know, there's, there's more at stake. Another example of something that's to the right of that is a dating site, right? So you could, you, like, you know, on this, the platform roadmap, we have, we have a little spot which we call indecent, <laughs> you know, to play on, on, on uh, uh, decentralization and, and dating, um, which would be another application that you could build on top of our content distribution network uh, and economic engine. Um, uh, that would be of, of, of great social value. So it's like a decentralized OkCupid, um, if that makes sense. So yes, lots and lots of applications uh, can and should um, make it, take advantage of this platform. And that's sort of our aim. And we, we think that if, the, if, we, if we get the platform right, then there's a rich ecosystem begins to emerge rather quickly. So how would those applications that you see people building on Scenario, how do those compare with what people are building today on Ethereum? Do you think that will be a similar type of application and use case that people will address here, or will that be very different applications? And will those applications themselves look similar, or will they be very different? Well, currently, I don't know how you do con content distribution with, with Ethereum. How, how do you do that? Where, 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 where does the content live and how is it related to the transactions? I mean, I, I guess one of the things that people sometimes do sort of the IPFS uh, EVM type thing. Yeah, or... Exactly. Right. So essentially you have to do this side by side thing. And that's where we see a lot of, uh, a lot of issues, which is why we, we ended up having to do a sort of wedded, a wedded technology or a unified technology because we, we, we believe that there are significant security issues with that kind of approach. And then the type of uh, application that people will build on Scenario would be spe specifically around content distribution. So video site, social media network, but for example, not something like what people are building today on Ethereum, like a prediction market or some sort of maybe a organizational structure like DAO type thing with voting and and decision making. Yeah, yeah, no, actually, uh, it's, it's quite interesting because I see that in, in today's world, all applications are inherently social. Let's look at a really good example, right? Who would have thought that code um, version history would be a social thing, right? Did the, people, did the people who built subversion think about, you know, code revision management? and code source uh, uh, history as a social thing? Probably not, but GitHub is definitely social. And I would love to see a, um, a, a version control system um, built on top of the Scenario platform. And there are lots of good reasons for that, right? That, um, it, it, that's, that's one way that you could begin to also guarantee the security of the code that gets deployed um, in the decentralized setting. Which, which is that you have both the security, the security benefits of the platform, but you also have the security benefits of the community that's interested in that code, right? And that also points back to the DAO, right? Which has to do with, with the relationship of governance to, um, uh, to code and governance to the behavior of these kinds of systems. Does that, 
Is that making sense? You see how I'm kind of trying trying to tie the loop there? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it, it does make sense. I, I think that uh, having a, uh, a wedded approach, uh, as you mentioned, uh, does have some advantages. Now, let's um, perhaps get into the architecture a bit more. Uh, so we mentioned that there's a there's a blockchain layer. So that's sort of the, the ledger of transactions. There's a smart contracting layer, there's a storage layer. Uh, and on top of that, you have the application layer. Uh, let's get into perhaps uh, the smart contracting layer and the storage layer. Uh, starting with the smart contracting layer, uh, how, so I guess if we were to use a frame of reference, uh, Ethereum would be a frame of reference with people, which people would already know. How is, uh, um, the smart contracting layer in uh, scenario different or similar from Ethereum? Yeah, so so uh, si similar, um, what we store on the blockchain is, is not uh, simply a ledger, right? In the same way that Ethereum stores the state of the virtual machine, the Ethereum virtual machine on the chain, right? We're storing the state of a particular virtual machine on the, on the, on the chain. And then ledger-like or financial-like applications are built above that virtual machine. Um, so that that's the, that's where they're similar. the The kind of virtual machine that's being stored um, is very different. So, in particular, we allow fine grain concurrency. Um, so, the Ethereum virtual machine is essentially sequential, and in fact, um, the 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 sequential nature of the way transactions are processed is. Um, is one of the reasons why there are lots of interesting scaling questions about Ethereum. So just sorry, sorry to interrupt, but perhaps uh, for, for those who are not familiar with the with concurrency, could you just briefly explain what that means in, in, in the context of smart contracts? Yeah, so, so imagine that within a single smart contract, you have lots of threads of activity that are all going to happen at the same time. So... Uh, so, for example, in a loan improvement application, typically what you want to do is you want to go and check the title of the, uh, like I'm talking about a home loan improvement. Uh, you want to go and check the, the title of the property that you're talking about. And at the same time, you want to go and check the credit history of the applicant. Now, you don't have to sequentialize those, and it's a very bad idea to sequentialize those. Um, what you'd like to do is to do a kind of fork join, where you fork off both, um, not, this is not fork in the sense of forking the chain, but you fork off both activities and let them run simultaneously. And then, and then when you have answers to both, then you can continue with the process, right? And, and this, this is just key to all, all kinds of human activities. The fork join pattern is just standard in, uh, another example is, you know, when you submit a paper to a conference for review, as my co-author Mike Stay and I just did to FOSSEX, um, what happens is a copy of the paper gets forked off to three or, or so reviewers. And then each reviewer is simultaneously reviewing the paper. And then each reviewer will then supply um, their comments. And then from the, co um, you know, from the collated comments, then a decision will be made about the paper. So um, the, the, the Rolang um, smart contracting system and the row VM allows for that kind of con uh, concurrency, that kind of simultaneous activity um, within a single smart contract. Um, and, and we believe that this is the essence of scaling. Now, the, there's a caveat, right, which is that it's really easy to screw up. Um, and the DAO is, is an example where it, when you have activities that are unfairly treated, like, like you accept new client requests um, in uh, more with more priority or, or unfairly over uh, updating um, the state of the chain, then then you can have you can have bugs, um, and and that's why the other side of the the other piece of the puzzle is that you have to have something that allows you to reason about the correctness of these concurrent activities, um, and that's where the Rolang's type system uh, is so important because it allows programmers, like most programmers, whether they're Haskell programmers or Java programmers or F-sharp programmers or, or OCaml programmers, I mean, just like most programmers in the world who are building scalable, large-scale mission-critical systems are dealing with typed languages. Yeah, I mean, yes, there's this whole weird JavaScript community that, that is untyped, but if you look at the big three, right, Microsoft, Google, um, 
and Facebook, they, they, they have all put forward alternatives to JavaScript that are typed. So, so what, what is a, a typed language for those uh, like me who are not familiar with that? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> In today's languages which are typed, essentially the types kind of uh, make programs look like wires and there are standards for the plugs on either end of the wire. So, you know, you don't try to, to plug, you know, a, a, a 10 base T connection into a USB port, right? That, that's what the types are, are doing. But Brolang's types go quite a bit further. They, they don't just say, you know, how you can plug these together from the point of view of, of inputs and outputs. They say how you can plug them together, more like plugging components onto a motherboard so making sure that the components all play nicely together. Um, so that that's that's the, you know the, the the rough idea. So I, th I think an example. Correct me if I get this wrong. Right of uh, of something like JavaScript. Right, you could add the number three plus a string four, and then yeah. it would sort of automatically convert the string into a number and it's say seven, and, yeah. and then of course those kind of things can lead to lots of mistakes if one isn't careful. And then in a, in a typed, a strongly typed language, we would just give an error. Yeah, that's correct. That's, ex that's exactly right. Um, and, and, and so what that means in terms of like production level code is when you, when you do have, the, when you do have um, uh, type checking, um, then the compiler is doing a lot of work that in other languages like JavaScript, you're having to write unit tests for. So in other words, you're not spending money on human labor to do things that could be done in an automated fashion. Uh, so code is produced more cheaply and more robustly. Today's magic word is concurrency. C-O-N-C-U-R-R-E-N-C-Y. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. So Greg, I'm, I'm curious about that because one, one of the big arguments that people have used for Solidity, you know, is that because it's so similar to JavaScript, it's a lot of people know or can sort of easily get started and develop something and the, the barrier to entry is, is quite low. Now with, with some of those, you know, row, lang or, and, or PyCalculus, et cetera, those are, I think, much more esoteric languages. So do you think that's going to be a big hurdle in terms of adoption that people have to learn these new languages and especially uh, languages that are they're very different from the ones that they're used to? You know, I, th I think that's a great question. And I, I do think there, there is a little bit of a, of a mind shift. But I, I think one of the interesting things about this space, um, and, and I'm always thinking about adoption, and I've thought about adoption since, since Xlang and Microsoft. Um, so, so the Rolang, the the Rolang um, um, design is now benefiting from. Um, what, let's see, we released BizTalk in two thousand, so um, maybe eighteen years of design feedback from working with developers. Um, so, so, so yeah, there there will be some adoption issues, but interestingly about the blockchain is it's full of intrepid people. It's full of people who are are go-getters who are not afraid because, you know, hey, this is all brand new stuff anyway. <laughs> um, and, and it's very exciting. I mean, I, one of the things I say a lot in interviews like this, um, and, 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 and I say it often because it's true, I am so inspired by the blockchain space because there are so many people who, instead of complaining that the world is broken, they are rolling up their sleeves and they're getting work done. And they're unafraid to go and try something new. Um, and, and that's what gives me hope with respect to the introduction of these new tools and techniques. The, the reality is that, that formal methods and formal verification are, are, are kind of coming up silently behind the, the, the sort of more traditional development methodologies. And they're making huge headway. And the reason that they, they are necessary in this space is because they're necessary in all mission-critical spaces. It's a great idea to, to go for adoption, but if what you're doing is, is getting a lot of people who have no 
real understanding of how to do mission critical uh, financial applications, then you're going to have a lot more DAO bugs. A lot more. So, so either we, we begin to uh, adopt tools and techniques that are going to help people, even people who don't have experience with them, or, or we're going to be willing to take the pain. <laughs> <laughs> so well, then, and, and this is sort of an unrelated question, but I'm interested in knowing what you think about this. What are your thoughts on uh, major banks and even some central banks, uh, at least one that I know, uh, experimenting on Ethereum? You know, I, I, I think it's great. I think the more engagement and the more involvement um, with these technologies, the better. Um, at, at the end of the day, I'm not, I, 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 at a certain point, I've got, I got a little bit nervous about, you know, these deep pocketed institutions getting involved with this tech. And then I kind of relaxed because I, I realized that um, for, for the people who are paying attention, for the people who really understand what this technology is about, they are not going to just get back in bed with the banks. That's, that's not what this is about. Uh, and so if we're, if we're, if we're able to Tom Sawyer, you know, the deep resources of these institutions to build better blockchains. Yes. <laughs> mm. This is awesome. And if, if they don't do it open source, nobody's going to engage. Um, so I just, uh, to me, I just think there's this, this is tons and tons of positivity uh, about that. And I'm, I'm very excited. And at the end of the day, we all are going to have to come to the table in this dialogue, right? Whether you're whether you're um, an incumbent institution or a crazy startup doing doing things like a decentralized social network, everybody's going to have to be involved in in the conversation. Let's take a short break to talk about Jax. Jax is a multi-coin wallet created by the people at Decentral. Now, in the past, if you had a whole bunch of cryptocurrencies, it was a pain to handle them. You either had to leave them on an exchange, which was insecure or you had to have all these different wallets, which was a hassle. Fortunately, now with Jax, those medieval days of darkness, misery, and suffering are over. Jax supports multiple cryptocurrencies and new ones are being added. But it's not just storing cryptocurrencies you can do with Jax, but you can also exchange them directly from within inside the wallet thanks to their Shapeshift integration. And since there's only one seed, Jax makes it super easy to back up and sync to your other devices. Jax works with Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and has browser extensions for Firefox and Chrome. So go to jax.io, that's J A X.io, to download the wallet and get started today. We'd like to thank Jax for their support of Epicenter. Now, in scenario, is there is there like a consensus mechanism, something like proof of work or proof of stake? I mean, I know you, you worked with Vlad on on Casper as well. Did that influence the design of scenario in any way? Oh, oh, totally, absolutely. I mean, the, you know, the R chain, the consensus algorithm underneath the R chain is a variant of Casper. Um, you know, in some sense, we're we're heavily influenced by the work of Vitalik and of Vlad. Um, and, and we're very excited to be, you know, engaged and collaborating with, with Vitalik and Vlad on, on Casper. Again, the, the point here is that these algorithms, they're new, they're hard, they require a lot of focus and a lot of attention, and they require expertise from a lot of different fields. Like, you know, I, I'm, I'm amazed at, at the kinds of expertise that Vitalik and Vlad can bring to the, to the picture. And it's largely around crypto and economics. It doesn't, doesn't, isn't really much around the sort of programming language semantics, formal methods, right? But we're going to need all of that talent and all of that skill and expertise to design something that's actually workable at scale for mission critical systems. So, so totally, yes, we are heavily influenced. One of the places where we differ, for example, that I'm very excited about is um, if you look at uh, Vitalik's algorithm and, and Vlad's algorithm, the, the bedding, like, uh, I don't know if your audience is familiar with the way Casper works, but essentially um, there's, there's, there's a moment, there, there are moments uh, in the consensus uh, steps where the validators, and these are the, the entities that replace miners in proof of work, the validators are effectively betting on which block is next in the chain. So that, that's a simplification, but, but that's, that's a, a, a way to get a foothold here. And um, 
and and what you want is to make sure that the um, the, the bets converge as rapidly as possible um, towards towards you know a, a common outcome so that so that everyone ultimately agrees and you can imagine that people could kind of game the system right so one of the ways that they might game the system is they could equivocate they could they could bet on one side and then on the other but not in a way that's justified they're doing this um, from some sort of nefarious uh, economic motivations or, or other kinds of motivations and and um, and the Casper algorithm the the punishments and rewards um, for um, for betting behavior um, essentially uh, make it so that um, uh, those players who are are well behaved uh, are left standing economically whereas those who are are, are, are betting in a, in a sort of more nefarious way they end up um, draining their resources so but so, so that part is somewhat independent from what they're betting on and if you bet on um, if you bet on blocks um, then you are effectively rate limiting the algorithm what what um, the R chain um, thing does and, and actually Vitalik makes makes uh, use of that fact uh, in in reasoning about certain kinds of timing the R chain bet doesn't bet on blocks the R chain bets on propositions that describe the shape of the blockchain and, and there's there's a good reason for that the, the reason for that so that that means that that each each validator is saying, you know, my requirements are that this transaction occurs and this transaction occurs and this one comes before either of those, right? And that sort of thing. So, so there are constraints on the shape of the blockchain. And the reason that's important is because if you think about it, when you go to buy a coffee in your local coffee shop, uh, unless either of you happens to be living in Shanghai, I didn't check that. <laughs> uh, no, okay, good, right? So, so then the cost of me buying a stick of of um, uh, a tofu from a street vendor, you know, that 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 transaction should be independent and have no conflict with your coffee purchase at a local coffee shop, uh, and that's part of the reason that global financial networks scale is because most of the transactions are isolated, right? And that's the, that will be the same in the case of validators. Most of the transactions are going to be isolated. The only time you ever need to engage consensus is if they have constraints that are at odds with each other. Like I say, you know, transaction it has to A has to come before transaction B, and you say no, no, transaction B has to come before transaction A. And at that point, that's when you have to have some kind of uh, um, betting structure or betting strategy, right? And so bet by proposition. Um, uh, can potentially allow for, well, well, uh, I'll skip a bunch of technical details. But what it can allow for is to realize tens of thousands of blocks all at once, because you're only betting on the shape of the chain, not specific blocks. And so, at, at the moment you reach consensus, you're con you're reaching consensus about a big giant chunk of the chain. So this gives you much much better throughput rates. So does that is that making sense? You know, does that uh, answer your question? It, it kind of makes sense on a on a high level. I think the the general idea, right, that you're gonna have activity going on in different corners of the network, and that can be unrelated. And it this sort of idea that every single thing is is validated together. That that's maybe not the most efficient idea. I think a lot of people will can relate to that easily. Sweet, sweet. So, so that's, it's, I mean, it's certainly impressive just how innovative and how different and how like from the ground up, a lot of this stuff is, is designed in a novel way. Um, so it, it really sounds complete or very much unlike any of the other blockchain projects out there. Yeah, it's, so I, it's, I, I, I confess, I, I often feel um, funny about it just because I mean certainly we, we, we've tried to build on others work but we've also tried to be keep our eyes wide open about um, requirements right and er, every step every step of the way we've been driven by market requirements we're not trying to innovate <laughs> we really really you know it's like if I could just pull something off the shelf and have it do that thing that'd be great because then I could get more sleep <laughs> yeah <laughs>
you mentioned before uh, the currency, right? So we have this aspect that, you know, I post content on this scenario. I want it to be popular. So I like put some money behind that. And, and, and so we have this kind of mechanisms. So I think this currency is called AMP. Can you talk a bit about this? So a, a few questions on this, you know, how many are there? How are they created? Like who owns them? How did they obtain them? And then what's their function in the network? Right. Okay. So, so uh, first of all, I want to make a quick distinction between amps versus Rio. So a amps are sort of the unit of the attention economy. They're, they're the means by which people promote posts and, um, and, you know, essentially how value flows in the, this chain of valued content. Um, oh, initially we, when we thought we were going to be able to utilize the Bitcoin blockchain, for our initial crowd sale, we um, we minted all the entire AMP supply all at once, um, and uh, and that was via the Omni layer on top of the Bitcoin protocol. As we became more and more savvy about um, the actual uh, market requirements and the technological um, basis for delivering the market requirements, we realized that that wasn't going to fly, and so um, essentially there will be a new AMP token. Issued on the um, on the R chain, and there will be a conversion from existing amps, which people hold and trade today, um, to uh, uh, to this new amp token. And of course, it will be sort of linked to to you know you know risk versus versus uh, you know reward in the sense that people who jump onto R chain sooner will be able to get a better rate for the conversion than people who wait in, until later. Um, but Essentially, that you know that kind of makes sure that we're we're holding true to our promise to our investors. Um, so the the AMP is the the crypto token that's associated with the attention economy, and ultimately, uh, AMPs will be convertible into the R chain equivalent of gas, right? And that's what allows you to essentially buy. Um, if every post ends up being its own smart contract, and we believe that this is kind of the killer, um, uh, uh, this is the killer app. For Rolang, is that the reality is that every post in the scenario network is its own little tiny smart contract. Um, so, so if if that's the case, then there's a there's a reason to have the amp. This is this, this nice connection or thread from amps down to the rate limiting um, feature of the the Rovian. So to just rephrase that, if I got this correctly, so there was um, a sort of an amp sale that was done with on the Omni layer, which Omni, uh, some people may remember that as MasterCoin once upon a time. Uh, and, and now when the scenario is kind of live, there will be a new currency equivalent to Ethereum's gas that's going to be created there. Those amps are going to be essentially can be kind of moved over. And so you're going to have a new, a new crowd sale to sell additional of that gas like currency or that's, that's close let me let me <laughs> make it slightly more accurate all right so so um yes we have we've had not one but two crowd sales in which we sold the minted tokens to capitalize the the project when we have our chain you'll be able to convert those tokens directly onto the tokens for for the r chain the the uh, um ethereum's gas is not the same as ether right you convert you, you can pr essentially purchase gas with ether so the amp token is like is like ether more than gas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, and uh, and you know, it's it's not necessarily the case that that the conversion event is a crowd sale. It's just that we want to make sure that people move over to our chain, right? So people who are holding amps should be moving to our chain as soon as possible. Um, now that said, um, you can use the bits right now. You can go to Docker and get our Docker image uh, and stand up a node right now. Um, so you can you can play with it. You can have the user experience. We do not recommend this uh, for any sort of you know mission critical amps. The only amps that should be flowing through those nodes are testnet amps. Yeah. Uh, so so you recently uh, I believe ended the the crowd sale. Uh, crowd in sale which you, two. In crowd sale two, in in which you raised. Uh, close to five million U.S. dollars, uh, four point seven million, I think. Yeah. Um, so, could you talk about? Uh, well, 
I guess there's a couple of questions about this. One is what is the sort of structure of a scenario? Is it, is it a company? Is it a foundation? Um, what will the governance model be around the allocation of those funds? And, uh, and you know, what uh, do you plan to use that money for? Yeah, uh, so the, those are all fantastic questions. I mean, I, I, I should say that um, even before the crowd sale launched, um, we were holding a, the first scenario governance conference. So we are fully, fully committed to this being a network owned by the people who use it. Um, and we are, we are working as hard as we can to build a, a cookie crumb trail from the current situation where Scenario Limited is the company that holds the amps to a place where, uh, and ho holds the funding to a place where, you know, um, the funds are, are allocated according to the will of the community. Right, so that that's that that is our our you know hard of we we hold fast to that aim. Um, uh, so Scenario Limited is an Israeli-based uh, company. In order to do any sort of uh, you know to to pay for people doing work for Scenario, there has to be some kind of incorporation because there's always taxes involved, right? Um, and so the choice at the time was to. To um, to do an LTD, um, and and but now we're essentially moving in a step by step, you know, reasoned fashion to a structure um, that is a, a better and better governance model. So uh, one of the things that we are aiming to do is to move from a sort of standard um, corporate CEO, CTO, C star O structure, and then reports like that is to have a partnership model more like a law firm where you have managing partners, partners and associates, right? And then people can engage at, at, at whatever they, the level they feel is appropriate for themselves. Um, so that, that's kind of step zero from where we are to get to something that's, that's much more flat. Um, and, and then one of the things that we hope to do is for the R chain itself, we build a, a, a nonprofit um, organization and I'm hoping that that is going to be a, a cooperative um, uh, so we're again we, we're we're learning as much as we can about that kind of governance model um, I was in cooperatives when I was in college so I went to Oberlin College in the US um, and um, more than 25 percent of the student body there is uh, uh, lives and works in cooperatives uh, my own co-op we we made all our own tofu, did all our own yogurt, granola, baked all our own bread. We ran the housing and everything, right? So, so I'm, I'm quite familiar with these kinds of governance models, uh, and they make me very happy. <laughs> um, and we're fully committed to this stance in which um, uh, the scenario, the way the funds are allocated in scenario, reflect the will of the community. Um, but we have to operate within certain parameters in today's society until we can you know, sort of build a practical step-by-step -step, uh, mechanism to get to that place. And so then, uh, I guess, uh, before we wrap up here, let's talk about the product a little bit. Uh, you, you mentioned that you can download a Docker container and start playing with testnet uh, AMP coins. Um, what, where, where is the product at right now in the roadmap, and what does that roadmap look like over the next uh, 6 to 12 months? Yeah, so essentially... Um, what, what we've got is a rough sketch of the user experience and a very, very rough sketch for, for the content distribution mechanism that's built around some abstractions called, which I've been developed called the reactive media. So it's, it's essentially taking the reactive programming paradigm and applying it to social media. This is no big surprise. Facebook is engaged in similar kinds of activities. Um, but there, but the, 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 the programming paradigm is, specific, is uh, especially well suited to this domain. Um, and a bunch of other domains uh, as well. Um, and uh, so, so please take a look at the, you know, what it, what it looks and feels like to, you know, to post and, and share with people um, use in the user, in the content part, the content distribution part of the user experience. The very, very nascent part of the attention economy is also available in one of the branches, and this would be SOC uh, 92 Omni. Um, that will be moved into staging uh, presently, in which case people will be able to play around with the, um, the testnet amps. Um, so the big picture, 
uh, is we're going to be rewriting the back end so that we have you know one one thing which is the content distribution network on top of our chain um, and so that we don't block the development of the user experience uh, this is eff effectively the reason we're releasing these bits we want people to play around with it uh, give us feedback help us you know get it right um, uh, and that will in inform iterations of the UI um, while we're rebuilding the back end um, and so the aim and the hope is that we have the back end redone and the UI um, uh, in round, in version two um, by uh, the, uh, Q4 of 2017. Um, and with uh, lots of interesting drop points along the way. Uh, so we're hoping, hoping very much to have a, um, a, a drop point where people can be playing with the R chain um, kind of uh, Q3 of 2017. Um, so that that's kind of a rough picture uh, of of uh, things uh, of the roadmap. So yeah, I mean feel, we've we've published the roadmap in various forms. So please go check the, that out as well. And you know if anybody has any, uh, in, if anyone in, in your audience you know has thoughts about uh, better ways to organize the roadmap or or anything that I said, we really really welcome comment and feedback. Yeah, we're certainly gonna. Get encouraged that and we're going to have links to to all, all of the resources i mean there's a very comprehensive white paper uh, and a website and and links so people can also i mean you can download the software today right and and, and right. play around with it yeah and great so uh, thanks so much for coming on greg uh, it's a fascinating project and i certainly look forward to to seeing how it evolves i think it's super ambitious and I think uh, you're onto something, so let's <laughs> let's hope it's gonna have that impact that you're hoping for. Th thank you so much, and I really, really appreciate the chance to chat with you guys. It was very stimulating, and, and you guys asked really thoughtful questions. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much, Craig, and of course, thanks so much for listeners. So we are part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. You can find this show and many other shows on Let's Talk Bitcoin .com. And well, of course, you can subscribe to the show on any of the podcast players or watch the videos on uh, youtube.com slash Epicenter Bitcoin. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.